Thank you for joining us for College uh, CSE Class 201, class number six. Is that correct? Am I on schedule here? Good. All right. And we are talking about what's on our seminar tape number one, going through at a snail's pace, chasing every rabbit and kicking every dog uh, that we come by, talking about things that we always get, never get time to talk about in the seminar. We hope this will give you some ammunition to be better uh, equipped to handle the evolution religion that is running rampant in this world. I want to start off with talking about what's, uh, what do most Americans believe. According to surveys, year after year, from 1991 to 05, which is this year, consistently a very high percentage of people are not buying into this evolution theory. Now it's around 55 to 57 percent of the people believe God made the world in the last 10,000 years. So <clears throat> you have to figure out, or you have to realize, this is in spite of all the intensive propaganda since 1963 in the textbooks that we talked about last week. <clears throat> Here we've been brainwashing the kids intensively that the earth is billions of years old and they're still not buying it. Now, when I bring this up in debates and uh, things like that at universities, I'll say, look, 60% of the Americans don't believe this stuff that you're teaching. Anybody want to guess what the evolutionist response is? They're dumb. If they only took a course on evolution, then they would understand. Uh, if only they were smart, you know, <clears throat> it is always the, you know, they're too dumb to understand. I was in a debate one time and one of the professors and uh, he was saying about how that, you know, people who don't understand and uh, believe in creation. And I said, how many of you folks, in, there are about 1,200 people out there. I said, how many of you folks in the audience took that to mean you're dumb and he's smart? And they all raised their hand. You know, all those creationists raised their hand. He said, I never said that you're putting words in my mouth. I said, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, sir. I'm trying to explain how your statement came across to these people. When you say people don't believe like you because they haven't been educated enough, you're implying that they're dumb and you're smart. Once again, how many of you understood him to say that? And they all raised their hand again. The guy got mad. He never understood. That is exactly what it means. It is purely ego driven. Now, it is a fact, of course, that majority opinion doesn't prove anything. This 60% could be wrong, I would agree. But it is just a simple fact that all the surveys show a very high percentage, the majority in most cases, are believing what the Bible teaches basically. God made the world in less than 10,000 years, less than 10,000 years ago. Only about 10%, roughly plus or minus a few percentage points, about 10% of the population claims they are atheistic evolutionists. So, you know, there's no God involved, just pure evolution. And you look, uh, somewhere around 30% believe that God guided the process of evolution. So they also would believe there's a God and God did it, but he did it through evolution. So I guess you could say by that uh, logic that about 90% of the population believes God created the world. So you can see from the surveys here, about 10% of the population are atheistic evolutionists. And I have said for years, I think that 10% needs to go start a private school and teach evolution to anybody that wants to pay and come learn it. It should not be taught in the public school system at taxpayer expense. Evolution is a religion in every sense of the word. You have to believe all sorts of things to believe in evolution. <clears throat> and if they want to believe it, that's perfectly fine. This is America, the land of the fee and the home of the slave, or knave, whatever. And you can believe whatever you want, and you can teach whatever you want, but not at my expense. If you want to teach evolution, go start a private school. <clears throat> now, this guy writes in this uh, textbook, biology textbook, Discovering Biology. He said, <clears throat> 1994 survey showed 46% of adults in the United States did not think humans had evolved from earlier species of animals. And an additional 9% of those surveyed were not sure. The results of this and other similar surveys are startling because evolution has been a settled issue in science for nearly 150 years. You talk about an ego-driven statement, you know. In other words, how dare you question our theory? Everybody knows it's true. This is the type of dogmatism you get in any cult, okay? All cults do this, you know, we're right, nobody else is right, we're the only ones right, you have to have us to guide you through this wilderness and to be a beacon of light to guide you into all truth, okay? And this textbook author thinks, you know, it's just startling that people still believe in God. He's just amazed at that. Uh, well, anyway. The Washington Times article, 1998, uh, said 55% of the natural scientists, this would be people involved in the natural sciences, biology, etc., believe in Darwinian evolution. Now, that is a majority, okay, but just barely. 55% of the people believe in, of the scientists believe in Darwinian evolution. 
Of course, in order to become a natural scientist and get a job at a university or something like that, you're going to have to go through course after course after course on evolution and go through all the brainwashing. How many of the Soviet teachers 10 years ago believed in communism? All of them. At least they said they did. You know why? Because if you said you didn't, what would happen? You'd be in, academic, you'd be in Siberia if you lived, okay? And here in America, if you don't profess to believe in evolution, you will be in academic Siberia. You will lose your job. I was in a debate here just recently, and I asked the professor, uh, I said, if a teacher, if a professor in your university, I think it was University of Alaska, Fairbanks, I said, if you had a professor in your university who did not believe in evolution, what would you do? He said, to the effect, I would make sure they lost their job. Because you're not qualified to teach in this university if you don't believe in evolution. That was his thinking. I mean, that is how bad it is. We'll go through when we get to seminar part seven, some case after case after case where people have actually lost their job because they dared to question evolution. We'll go on seminar part seven. We will go through case after case where people have actually lost their job because they dared to question evolution. It is just a holy, it's a sacred cow. You just don't dare make fun of the sacred cow of evolution. Now, the fact that a majority of scientists believe something means nothing, okay? There have been many times throughout the history of science where they taught things that were just absolutely wrong. They used to teach for, for decades, for actually for centuries, they taught that the planets go around the earth. This is called the geocentric theory. Geo means earth, okay? The heliocentric theory, he, helio means sun. When people started first thinking, you know, we're having a problem here, as they discovered the planets as going around, they would watch them. And it's very interesting, especially Mars is the, the, the problem planet, the primary one, because Mars is going around the Earth, around the Sun, and the Earth is going around the Sun, but the Earth is going a little faster. So if you look at Mars every night through a telescope, you see Mars is going across the sky. You know, the planets, or the stars stay pretty stationary, but the planets move. That's what planet means, wanderer. Planet means wanderer. I think five of the planets, not counting Earth, are visible with the naked eye. If you know where to look and stare long enough, you can see them. Our little bitty telescope we've got here at Dinosaur Adventure Land, a little two-inch scope, you can see the rings on Saturn with that, you know. It doesn't take a lot to see the rings on Saturn. Uh, of course, the moon is, you know, the craters are highly visible with, with the naked eye. We get a little magnification at all, and you can see some amazing things on the moon. But the planets wander through the sky. However, if you watched Mars and plotted it night after night, here we are, if you look at it at the same time, say, say midnight, same time every night, you look, where's Mars? Here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. And then for two weeks, it goes backwards. Here it is, here it is, here it is, and turns around and goes back again. Here it is, here. Well, that's because we're passing it up in the orbits, okay? So they came across this problem where they noticed that the, the planets appeared to go backwards for a, a week or two and then took off again forward. Well, that's the same effect you would have if somebody's way out in front of you and they're driving 40 mile an hour and you're driving 50 mile an hour around a racetrack. Well, uh, they'll be in front of you, but as pretty soon, you know, they're back behind you and then they take off again. You know, they're still behind you, but they're, you know, there's no longer the loop back. Well, there were all kinds of scientists trying to figure out how on earth can these planets be going backwards. And so they developed a theory called epicycles. And you can see on the picture here on the left, the they got the planets not only going around the Earth, they have them going uh, little circles or as they go around the Earth. So it's looping. They called it epicycles to explain how the planets could be making this backwards motion. And the more study that was done on this in the 1500s and 1600s, the more people became concerned that maybe our basic theory is wrong. And so then guys come along like Galileo and Copernicus and other guys, and you know they start arguing about this. You know who's Who's got the right theory for the, the order of the universe? And there were some, especially in the Catholic Church, who were very dogmatic that the Earth is the center of the solar system. Everything goes around the Earth. We are it. The Earth doesn't move. It is stationary. And they would use verses like Joshua told the sun to stand still, you know, etc. See, the sun couldn't stand still if the Earth was going around the sun. And when people dared to question what's called the geocentric theory, man, they, they got in serious trouble. Galileo was called in before a council of Catholic elders and priests and says, look, you either recant of this heresy, because he was teaching, look, I think the evidence shows we're going around the sun, not the sun going around the earth. And he would go through all the mathematics, says, look, you know, the planets can't reverse their order. These little epicycle theory is stupid. It doesn't work. 
we are going around the sun, and so is Mars, and that explains why we're passing it up, and it appears to be going backwards. That, and it's, very, it's true, it's very logical. But boy, the Catholic Church got all upset and said, man, you are upsetting all of our theology, and we're going to burn you at the stake unless you recant of this heresy. So I want you to write a book saying, no, you're sorry, you're wrong. <laughs> this, everything goes around the earth. But the, the, an established worldview is called a paradigm. You want to write that down. Paradigm, P-A-R-A-D-I-G-M, I believe is the spelling paradigm. That is the way you look at things, the way people look at things. Your par par paradigm is another way to say your worldview. When someone has an established worldview of geocentrism, in other words, the earth is the center, it's very difficult to overturn that, especially when the, most of the world believed that, because after all, that's what the scientists taught, that's what the priests taught, Every, no, and nobody thought to check it out, but everybody believed it. And they said the earth doesn't move. <clears throat> well, there were quite a few Scientific, scientific experiments done during that time that said, hey guys, the earth does move. Quite a few observations were made, like for instance, if you take a pendulum, you get a heavy rock or a weight and you get it swinging on a rope, if you let it swing and come back and look at it in a couple hours, it's swinging over this way. It moved. Well, they knew from the laws of physics that an object that's, you know, moving is going to stay moving unless it's acted on by an outside force. So what would be the force? A French scientist named Foucault, F-A-U-C-A-U-L-T, F-O-C-A-U-L-T, Foucault, I believe is his name. He did a lot of experiments with the pendulum. He would hang, hang a pendulum, a very, very huge brass ball that weighed, you know, hundreds of pounds, so it's unaffected by the wind or anything else, you know, it's just too heavy. Hang it from a tough cable and get this thing swinging. And you come back and watch it, and pretty soon it's swinging over this way, and then pretty soon it's swinging over this way, and pretty soon it's swinging over this way. And he did a thought experiment. They were real big in those days. He doing experiments just by thought without actually trying it, you know. Let's think this through. Like Galileo with his thought experiment, because everybody said a big rock falls faster than a small rock. Galileo says, I don't think that's true. They said, oh, yeah, we know it's true because Aristotle said it. You know, he was a smart man. He said it 2,000 years ago, so we know it's true. And Galileo said, well, hey, guys, if I took a 10-pound rock and a 5-pound rock and I dropped them, would a 10-pound would rock fall faster? They said, oh, yeah, of course. He said, well, <clears throat> what if I took a 10-pound rock and I broke it in half, but I tied the two pieces together with a string and I dropped it? Is it going to fall like a 5-pound rock or a 10-pound rock? Absolutely stumped him. Like, oh, duh, wow, I, I don't know. <laughs> okay? And just with that simple thought experiment, didn't even do the experiment, just thought about it, he, they began to realize, wow, we may have a problem with our basic underlying premise here. He said, well, what if I took him a 10 pound rock and broke it up into 10 pieces, all weighing a pound, but I tied them all together with strings and dropped them? Is it going to fall like one pound rocks or a 10 pound rock? And f finally, after going through the thought experiment, he said, you know, guys, let's go try it. So they went up on the Leaning Tower of Pisa, you all know the story, and dropped off the cannonball and the BB, you know, and hit the ground at the same time. And he proved something wrong that had been taught for 2,000 years. Now, when it comes to the geocentric, heliocentric argument, believe it or not, there are still some very smart people who are geocentrists. I've got several books in our library if you want to read up on the story about uh, the geocentric theory. There are some people who sincerely think, I've got some good friends, very smart friends, who are still convinced the earth is the center and the earth doesn't move. Well, Foucault said, if you hung a pendulum over the North Pole, and by an imaginary way you can hang a pendulum swinging, and the earth were turning to a person on the ground, it would appear like the pendulum is changing its swing because the person on the ground would see the earth, because that, the Foucault pendulum would prove the earth is turning. Now, when you get right on top of the equator and do it, it doesn't work. But if you're anywhere off the equator, like here at Pensacola at 30 degrees north latitude, you will try it. You can try it. Get a pendulum swinging, and gradually it starts moving over, swinging a different direction and swinging further. When I was up in Alaska at Fairbanks, they've got a big science center there with a huge Foucault pendulum with a bunch of little pegs they set up every day. And as the thing swings around, it knocks the peg over. How many have ever seen one of those? Smithsonian has a huge one, you know, probably weighs three tons, you know. Giant brass ball hanging like from a 70-foot cable or something. And it's, they try to make it as frictionless as possible. But it, it does demonstrate the earth does turn. The Foucault pendulum is one of the proofs the earth is actually turning. Another one is the fact that if you, 
do you, do you, are you more likely to get bugs smashed on your front windshield or on your back windshield? Front. Front, right? It's hard to smash them on the back windshield, right? <laughs> Unless you're backing up real fast. Well, the Earth is flying through space. If the Earth is flying through space, you would expect that it would hit dust and debris and meteor rocks in space and cause, you know, falling stars, comets, meteors, that kind of stuff. Which time of the Earth would actually hit them the most? Well, if you think about it, the way the Earth is traveling around the Sun, noon is always directly toward the Sun. If the Earth is turning, you are coming from nighttime, which is on the back side, into the Sun at 6 a.m., you are coming into the sunlight half of the Earth. So 6 a.m. is the leading side of the bullet. That's the front bumper, okay? 6 a.m. is the leading, as the earth, if the Earth is turning, and the Earth is going through space, somewhere, plus or minus a few hours from 6 a.m., you would be much more likely to get meteor showers or to run into stuff. And sure enough, of course, you don't see them after 6 a.m. because the sun's out, and, but, you know, because it's too bright and it overpowers the, the, the little brightness of the meteor, you can't see it. But basically, after midnight, from after midnight, especially around 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., is the ideal time to see meteors. It is not the ideal time for many other reasons, okay? Just go to sleep. But uh, if you want to see meteor showers, get up real early or go to bed real late. You know, uh, 3 or 4, 5 a.m. is the time. Get away from the city, and you'll probably see buku meteors. Well, that is another evidence that the Earth is actually moving through space. You would not get that effect if we weren't moving. There would be equal numbers at all times, okay? There are five or six evidences that they used back in the 15, 1600s when they were arguing about this, you know, argument. Does the earth turn and does the earth move? And there were scientists who were coming along with really irrefutable evidence saying, yes, the earth is turning and the earth is moving through space. And we are not the center of the solar system. Now, what does that mean? Well, some people took that as a threat to Christianity and said, well, then, you know, if the earth's not the center, maybe, you know, Maybe these scientists are going to disprove God, or we're going to abandon Christianity and all that stuff. Uh, and it became a real serious threat to Christians, and it should not have been. They had a false doctrine they were defending, thinking they were defending the Bible. I'm independent Baptist, and they do that all the time, too. They get their, they get their whole list of uh, doctrine that is added onto the Scripture. Of course, almost every church does that, you know. <laughs> Here's what the Bible says, and, be and because of that, here's our 30 rules, you know. Let's, how about let's just stick with what the Bible says, and let's... Your 30 rules, those are negotiable. Uh, but they added to the Word of God, and they come up with this false idea of the geocentric theory and said, see, anybody that disbelieves this is a heretic and should be burned at the stake to, you know, to purify the church. You've got to burn them to get this evil spirit out of them and all that stuff. It was sad, but that's what happened. Finally, after a long battle, the heliocentric theory won out. But as I mentioned, there are still some very smart people who hold to the geocentric position. People ask me, what do you think, geocentric or heliocentric? I say, well, I taught physical science for years. I think I would be a very tough case to convince otherwise. I'm willing to listen, but I am very convinced the heliocentric position is right. The sun is the center of the solar system, but the earth is the center of the universe. Solar system is the nine planets going around our sun. The universe is the whole thing, okay? So this little, you know, 93 million mile circle we go around, radius circle we go around, is basically nothing compared to star distance. And so from our vantage point, it appears that most of the stars are receding away from us. Now in the Bible, God said in Genesis uh, chapter 1 that He created the earth first, and then later He made the stars. In verse 14, He made the stars also. Well, if He made the sun first and the stars later, and then 17 times in the Bible it says He stretched out the heavens must have been important for him to say that. Now, 17 times he says he stretched out the heavens. Uh, everybody's worried, how did the light get from the star to here? They're worried about the wrong problem. How did the star get from here to there? Okay. If you made them all from here and stretched them out, then we would see a red shift. Everywhere we look, no matter which direction, we would see stars receding because this is where everything originated. We are the center of the universe. Now, I don't think we want to be the center of the solar system, uh, everything spinning around us, though the, you can read the geocentric theory stuff if you like. Anyway, that's just a couple examples. The, the big rocks fall faster, the heliocentric theory. There are thousands of theories through science that have been taught for years that are wrong. 
By the way, the idea that a big rock falls faster than a small rock was taught for 2,000 years before somebody dared to question it. I always encourage students, question what you're being taught. Question what I teach. Question. You question the Bible. It'll stand up to scrutiny. Come now, let us reason together, the Lord says. Nothing wrong with questioning the Bible. I don't believe that. Okay, well, test it out. Check it out. Uh, many people have become Christians by, you know, thinking they're going to prove the Bible wrong. And they go off on this lifelong quest. I'm going to prove that book wrong. And years later, after they try and try, you know, they, they end up getting converted. Someone once said a very uh, sharp statement. He said, the Bible is the anvil that has worn out many hammers. <laughs> a lot of people have beat on that book trying to get it to, you know, it, it just doesn't move. There, nobody's found anything wrong with it. I've had people say, well, I can't find anything wrong with it, but I just don't like it. Oh, well, okay, well, now you're being honest, all right? <laughs> now we know. I don't like it either. There's some things in that book I don't like. It cuts down, it cramps my style. You know, it says don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. Well, my flesh wants to do that. But here I got a book that says I can't do that. And so if I was going to invent a book, I wouldn't invent one like that. <laughs> That's the last thing I'd invent, okay? I'd get one that lets me do things. In, 18, in 1799, George Washington got the flu out riding his horse, according to the best knowledge I have. His doctors were called in, and they, uh, they were, the custom back then was to bleed someone, either to cut their wrist and take off blood or to uh, put leeches on them. But the idea was to get rid of the blood because they didn't have microscopes capable of seeing the capillaries. All they knew was the heart produced the blood and pumped it out to the body, and the body absorbed it. That's what they thought. The body is constantly absorbing this blood that's going out. So if you're sick, you have bad blood, take out some of your blood, take out all your blood if you have to, and you'll get better. Of course, they lost a lot of patients back in those days. But <laughs> By the way, there is some truth to the bloodletting, because especially men, they tend to get an iron overload. You can go to BillSardi.com and read his article, S-A-R-D-I, about men and iron overload. You don't want to take vitamins with iron after you're about, I think he says about 16. Don't take any iron. You get enough. It causes problems. After. When you're growing and developing, yes, but after that, you don't want iron in your vitamins. It causes, who cares? But read, read Bill Sardi's article about that. But George, there is some, so there is some good to bloodletting because you do get rid of iron when you bleed. You get rid of some of the iron in your body, in the uh, clotting mechanism. But George Washington, there's a, there's a lot of controversy about what really happened because the doctors that attended him as he died from bleeding, uh, they bled him twice, and you know, the first time they bled him, he said, well, he got worse, let's bleed him again. Oh, he died. Oh, wow, well. And of course, I'm sure they stood at the casket and said, well, we did the best we could do. You know, <laughs> He was standing at death's door, and we pulled him through. Yeah, you pushed him through, you idiot. But uh, the, uh, they thought, you know, if you take out your blood, you get better. Now, as I said, there's some controversy because the doctors were Mas Masonic Lodge members. And George Washington had been, I guess, put into the Masonic Lodge, not really knowing what it was. And... Uh, they have always, the Masonic, Masons always use pictures of George Washington laying the cornerstone for Washington, D.C. with his Masonic apron on, you know, and got the, you know, the, all the symbols on there. And they say, George Washington was a Mason. Well, that's true, he was a Mason for a while. Before he really realized what this organization was, and then he got out. And there are many people who think that the doctors, the Mason doctors, actually bled him too much on purpose to kill him. How do you prove that now? I don't know, you know, but that's just something to consider. If you find any evidence one way or the other, let me know. Um, but he was bled to death. Back in those days, and even today, uh, there were places all over the country that you could recognize quickly. It was a white pole with a red stripe around it. It was the barber. The barber was the guy who had the sharp razor to shave people, and who, if you had to take some blood out, he had the razor and he could take the blood out. You'd walk in the barber. What do you want today? Haircut, shave, or, you know, I want bled? I got a headache. Here, bleed me a little bit. You know, that's what they did. That's why the barber pole still has the red stripe around it today, because he was the blood letter. And the Bible says right there in Leviticus 17, 11, the life of the flesh is in the blood. I tell people if the doctors would have just read that verse, George would still be alive today. Well, he would live longer, okay? Now, if you went scuba diving and you found a treasure chest full of gold coins, and I asked you the very simple question, when did the boat sink? You say, I don't know. Well, look at the dates on the coins, all right? If there's a coin in there from 1750, you ought to be able to calculate pretty quickly that the boat had to sink after 1750. How many can figure that out with no help? Okay. 
It couldn't sink before that, right? You may find some older coins in the box, but that doesn't matter if you're trying to calculate when the boat sank. The limiting factor would be the youngest coin. And this is a good illustration to help people understand when we're going to go into here in a minute here, how to prove the Earth is not billions of years old. Well, there are some limiting factors. There are some, some ways to test the age of the Earth that show billions of years. There's no question. There are some that do that. If you have 500 ways to tell how old this Earth is, and, you know, 20 of them give billions of years, and 400 of them give, you know, less than 100,000 years, those are the ones you've got to worry about, the young ones. If I wanted to calculate, you know, when was this room built? I could look around and say, well, it has uh, copper wiring built into the walls, so that would mean, you know, probably built in the last hundred years, okay? It has uh, actually copper wiring in uh, twisted, you know, metal, flexible metal cable. Oh, well, metal conduit. Well, then I could figure out when was that made, and I could go back and limit it. I could look at some of the fabrics in the carpet and say, oh, wow, this has rayon. That wasn't developed until World War II, you know, so it's less than 60 years old. Through process of elimination, I probably could narrow it down to where we could get pretty close to when this building was built. If you walk into a house and you find it has green shag carpeting and green refrigerator and green stove and green sink, when was it built? 1970s, of course. Everybody had to have the green shag carpeting, you know. It's just, it just kind of tells the story of when it was built. Now, almost all toilets, if you take the lid off the back of the toilet, there's a date stamped right on there. When was the toilet made? Often, real estate people use that all the time to tell when was this house built. Flip the lid of the toilet back up in the backside where the tank is, you know. It'll have a date stamped right in there. Now, usually, you know, the toilet was put in with, within a year of its manufacture, you would assume, you know. So if the toilet says 1955, you know, probably the house was built around 56 or 57. So there are ways you can, you can narrow it down. I couldn't prove exactly when the room was built, except I happen to be here, so I know, okay? But uh, without an eyewitness observer, you could just through process of elimination narrow it down, you know, uh, to within the last 30 years this was built, okay? Actually within the last four years. But if you find a fossil, you got the same problem. You find a dinosaur bone, like this guy right This is a copy of it. The real one's right over there in the case, uh, straight, straight across from me. Uh, the real dinosaur bone, but this is, John makes uh, replicas of these in our fossil shop out back. That's a toe bone, one of the knuckle bones from a brachiosaurus. So I tell kids, when you find the dinosaur bone, you should notice two things about it right away. Number one, it does not talk. Number two, it does not have a date stamped on it. It does not say, made by a dinosaur in 70 million BC in Taiwan. Okay, They don't say that. So how on earth could you tell the age of a fossil? We have petrified stuff all over the museum. Petrified wood right here, petrified clams, petrified seashells, petrified ammonites, you know. I'm surrounded by stuff. Here's shark's teeth, petrified dinosaur bones. That whole wall is dinosaur bones over there. We're surrounded by stuff here that's petrified, fossils. How old is it? Well, none of them have a date on them. None of them talk. So we can put our interpretation on there if we'd like. But that's what it would be. It would be our interpretation. When, when, did, when, would they, when did they form? Really, if you want to test the age of a fossil or the, the age of anything, the ideal way to find out would be to find the guy who made it. Talk to the guy who built it. He'll know. If you can find the guy who built the house, like my grandfather up in Wisconsin, lived at 22nd and Cass in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Ole Espinus was his name from Norway. He built all kinds of houses across La Crosse, Wisconsin. He was a carpenter. So if we want to find out when a house was built, call Ole up. Hey, Ole, when did you build this house over here? So, oh, that was built. And you know, he would know. He did it. Okay. The ideal person to tell you the age of something is the one who did it. Well, the Bible says that God created the heaven and the earth. By the way, Genesis 1.1, properly translated, is the heaven singular. Many new versions say heavens. Eh, wrong. The heaven. The word heaven means expanded place. Apparently God made the earth and then one big expanded place that goes out who knows how far. Nobody knows how far heaven goes. Later he divides it up into three slices. And after this it is almost always called heavens. Plural. But in Genesis 1-1 it should be heaven singular. 
in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Here, God is claiming He did it, which means He did or He didn't. Okay, if He did, then He wouldn't know how old it is, right? And here we have in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, For by Him, talking about Jesus, quite obviously, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. So now Jesus is claiming He did it. So is this a conflict? No, that's one of dozens of pairs of verses you can put together that proves conclusively Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh. Jesus allowed Himself to be worshipped, didn't He? The Bible says, only worship the Lord thy God, Him only, nobody else. You don't worship anybody else. Why did Jesus allow Himself to be worshipped? Because He was God. And that's a whole study of how to prove Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh. There's dozens of verses that go together. They use the same names. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. In the Old Testament, God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Well, correct, okay? I can show you the Trinity in the Bible, but I can't, I can't explain it to anybody, okay? A lot of things can be shown, but not, beauty can be shown, but not explained. How do you explain beauty to somebody? Uh, you just got to see it, you know? And I can show you the Bible does teach the Trinity. I cannot explain it, okay? I can give you some illustrations, but every illustration breaks down at some point, okay? For instance, I am a dad and a son and a brother all at the same time. I have three very distinct roles, probably more than that, that I fulfill, but I'm only one person. An egg, for instance, is a shell, a yolk, and the album, the white, but it's only one egg. Three distinct parts, one egg. Uh, an apple, same thing. It has the core, the skin, and the pulp of the apple, etc. But every illustration breaks down at some point. But a lot of people try to explain the Trinity, and I just don't, I don't understand it. I know the Bible teaches it. You know, how can, one guy wrote into our program at truthradio.com or drlando.com, the program we have uh, every day, 4.30 to 6. You know, uh, what was the question, Jonathan, they were asking about uh, something about, can you explain, I would, when Jesus was here on earth, how did he say, why did he say the Father is greater than I? Well, because while he was on earth, it was true. He limited himself to a body, which means you can't be all places at one time. See, God is all pla not only all places at a time, he's all places at all times, all the time. He's right now in tomorrow. I can't understand that. How can he be here listening to me and over in China listening to them all at the same time? Talk about multitasking. How many saw the movie Bruce Almighty? You know, bad movie, but you ought to watch it. Um, okay. Here, he's hearing all these prayers in his head, you know, thousands of people praying. <laughs> he says, yes to all, answers them on the computer. You know, of course, they all pray to win the lottery, so they all win the lottery, and everybody gets 50 cents or something, you know. Now they're all mad because the lottery is divided up by a million winners. But here we have Jesus claiming that he is God Almighty. He says, Colossians says, by him were all things created. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in the deity of Christ, okay? They believe Jesus was the first created being. Jehovah's Witnesses teach God created Jesus, and then Jesus created all other things. So they add the word other in this verse. Get a Jehovah's Witness Bible. It'll say, by him were all other things created. Just by adding that word other, they change it. In Acts 20, uh, 2028, 20, somebody have a Bible there with them? Acts 2028, 20, somebody read that for me, would you? First one to find that. Acts chapter 20, I believe it's verse 28. God fed and took the of his blood. Right. Yeah, Acts 2028, 20, go ahead, Kevin. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Look at that carefully now. To feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. How could God purchase the church with His own blood? Jesus had to be God. So what Jehovah's Witnesses did is pretty slick right there. They said, to feed the church of God, which He hath purchased with the blood of His own. Switch two words. Instead of His own blood, it's the blood of His own. That's how they get their false doctrine in there. So you got, they're really slick, and you got to watch them, you know, <laughs> like a magician, you know. Watch this over here, poof, you know, they'll trick you if you're not careful. But here, Colossians is another one, they, they added the word other. Same thing in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. They say, 
and the word was a God. They stick the little letter A in there. They have to change it because it doesn't fit their doctrine. Anyway, Jesus claims He created the heaven and the earth. And Jesus said in Matthew 19.4, He's talking about marriage and divorce, but He made a very fascinating statement here in Matthew 19.4. And He answered and said unto them, Have you not read that He which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Obviously talking about Adam and Eve. So is Jesus claiming that the creation of Adam and Eve was the beginning? Yes, He is. I tell people it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. you got to say that these days. You know? Man, when I was a kid, it was a no-brainer. You know? Boys knew they were supposed to marry girls, you know? but today it's a little confusing out there. We're talking about stupid. Anyway, Matthew, Mark chapter 10 says basically the same thing. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. So, here we have Jesus claiming pretty clearly that the creation of Adam was the beginning. All right? Romans 5 tells us, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Well, obviously, this Romans 3 and 5 and other passages point out clearly we are all sinners. There's no question there. But why do we have death and suffering in the world? Well, according to the Bible, we have death because of man's sin. If evolution is true, death is a wonderful thing because that's how you get ahead. One animal evolves a little better than the rest, gets a new improved gene. What must happen to the rest of them in order for this process to work? They all got to die. Because if you got a herd of cows and one of them gets a new improved gene and becomes the super cow, if the rest of them don't die, that new improved gene is going to be swamped back into the population and nobody's going to know. Be gone. So evolution is actually a religion of death. Charles Darwin knew, you know, death is the hero to the plot. Now the Bible teaches death came because of man's sin. 1 Corinthians 15, since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead, talking about Jesus Christ. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Here it's real clear. Man brought death, and it tells us which man. Notice the parallelism here. By man came death, by man also came the resurrection, and then it names the two men. For as in Adam all die, in Christ shall all be made alive. Those are the two men it's talking about, obviously, in the first half of the verse. So Adam was the one who brought death into the world. And 1 Corinthians 15, 45 tells us real clearly, Adam was the first man. Well, if Adam was the first man and Adam brought death into the world, then it's going to be pretty easy to calculate the age of the earth. Genesis 3 says Eve was the mother of all living. The Bible's real clear on the topic, okay? Now, if you don't want to believe the Bible, that's fine, but you need to understand, as far as what the Bible says, it says Adam's the first man, Eve's the mother of all living. It could not be more clear. And when you read Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, you see the very same thing. I mean, it's just quite obvious this is what the book's teaching. Genesis 5 tells us, Adam lived 130 years and begat a son and called his name Seth. Now, we won't go into, at this time, why they lived so long. We'll get into that later in seminar part 2. You know, why did they live to be 900 years old? Uh, one atheist was reading through Genesis and it says, Adam lived, you know, 130 years and begat a son, called his name Seth, and he lived after Seth, you know, 800 years and begat sons and daughters. And then it says, and he died. You read a few verses later, it says, Seth, you know, blah, 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 and he died. You know, Enos, blah, 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 and he died, and he died, and he died. It goes all through the whole chapter, you know, and he died, and he died. The atheist set the Bible down and said, man, they all died, and it's going to happen to me too. I better get saved. <laughs> got saved reading the genealogies in Genesis chapter 5, you know, and he died, and he died, and he died. Yeah, you better think about it. You are going to die, okay? Me too. I tell people I'm going to try to make that the last thing I do, but it's going to happen, okay? You probably should plan to do the same, right? Then it says, Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. Enos lived 90 years and begat Canaan. You go through the Bible and you add up the dates. And some people argue there, there are gaps in the genealogies. Well, it is true there are three names missing. 
in the genealogies. There are three names that are gone in one of the genealogies that are listed in the other two. Well, why? Why is Canaan, for instance, missing after uh, Shem? In the later we'll see that. We'll cover that in seminar part seven, which will be about four years from now at the rate we're going on the class. But uh, who was Canaan, and why is his name missing? And there are five or six possible reasons why the names would be missing or scrambled. The, the Hebrew genealogy thinking is different than ours, okay? In their mind, a grandson is a son. A son-in-law is a son. Saul said to David, you know, who are you? Where are you, my son? Well, he married his do Saul's daughter, Michael. But he called him his son. And if you read through the Bible, you'll see if, if a man dies and has no children, the brother is to marry that woman, and the first child born gets the inheritance of the dead father. That was the way to keep things straight in, you know, in the tribes. This belongs to the tribe of Judah. This belongs to the tribe of Benjamin. You, know. you couldn't lose your inheritance that way. So that was you know, the, the, in the law of the firstborn. It's very, but their, their method of thinking is different than ours okay, in, in America. So you have to always put you know, Hebrew culture and tradition on the scriptures. There's a book I've got in our library called, um, oh, I slipped my mind now, but it's about uh, tradition, Bible traditions and how if you read through that, it just makes so much sense. Like for instance, it's Hebrew tradition when you're leaving the table, but you're going to come back. You fold your napkin. But if you're leaving and you're not coming back, you wad it up. Now, we wouldn't think about that, but that's the way they think. Oh, he folded the napkin. He's coming back. Jesus rose from the grave. They found the grave clothes there in the grave, and the napkin that was about his face folded. Well, guess what that means? He's coming back. Now, see, there's little Hebrew traditions like that that you just wouldn't catch until you realize, wow. That's cool. You know, there's thousands of things like that. What's the name of that book? Uh, oh, there have been many books written on it. Bible cultures, Bible traditions. Anyway, we can check in the library for that. It doesn't matter. But you say, how do we know there are no gaps in these genealogies here? Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahaliel, Jared, Enoch. Well, there are several New Testament verses that kind of close the gaps for you. For instance, in the book of Jude, which is next to the last book in the Bible, it says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam. Oh, hey, hey, that closes a bunch of gaps, doesn't it? If Enoch is the seventh from Adam, you got Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahaliel, Jared, Enoch. Well, there are no gaps at least that far, right? And there are other, other passages, like when you read through the book of Judges, it gets a little confusing, you know, how, how long does this take place? Or the book of Kings, you know, what a confusing, you got to really work on it to try to figure out, you know, how does this all go together on a timeline? But then you find some New Testament verse that says, God gave them judges for the space of 350 years. Oh, solved it for you. Bingo, one verse, you know. Or, or they're mistreated in Egypt for 400 years. Bingo, one verse solves it all. But the point is, if you add up these dates give, that are given in the Bible, and Bishop Usher did an amazing job at this, spent a lifetime doing this, okay? The book, maybe Jonathan, during the break, you can get that, uh, the Bishop Usher's book, Annals of the World, of the World and we'll show that here. Um, he spent his whole lifetime working on this very problem, when was the creation? By adding up all the dates and working it over and over and over, he said came up with 4004 B.C. for the creation. Nobody's ever proven him wrong. Very interesting. Never been proven wrong. It doesn't mean he's right, but he's never been proven wrong, and a lot of people have tried. Could that date be correct, 4004 B.C. for the world? Well, we'll cover that after the break. All right, welcome back from the break. Let's take up with uh, where we left off about the age of the earth. Bishop Usher, who wrote this absolutely amazing book, Annals of the World, this was written in, what, 1700-something, Jonathan, in Latin, and finally translated just in the last, uh, uh, last 20 years, I guess. Somebody spent years and years and years translating this into English. It is uh, phenomenal, all the research that's gone into this, plus you get it on CD. Almost all ministries sell this book for 75 bucks. We sell it for 65 okay? One yes. sells it for 350 One min Christian ministry sells it for 350 but they won't take a dime over 400 <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, if you want to get the Annals of the World, uh, 65 bucks, it's fabulous. Uh, just incredibly thorough. Nobody's ever refuted what he's written in here. Bishop Usher spent his lifetime working on that. He came up with the date of 4004 B.C., October 23rd, at 2 in the afternoon for the creation. Now, I don't think you can get that close from Scripture, okay? But... Uh, Maybe he did. Um, I know that 
the month of October is what the Jews have always said, and that's why we just, what was the big feast they just had last couple days ago? Uh, Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. They say that is the creation of the world. And that's going to be the end of the world also, they say. The, end, the world will end in October, some, some year. Okay. So since we're past uh, Yom Kippur, we've got to wait another year. If, if they're all right about that. I don't know when the Lord's coming. I'm hoping it's soon, but you know, it couldn't be imminent if you could know the date. But I don't know about the 4004 B.C. I do think Adam was created in the afternoon, though, because it was just before Eve. Uh, and I tell people, I, I, I believe I figured out why God made Adam first. It's because he didn't want any advice on how to do it. <laughs> of course, all the men think that's hilarious, you know. Kind of like lawyer jokes, you know. The lawyers don't think they're funny, and the rest of people don't think they're jokes, you know. <laughs> but uh, 4004 B.C. By the way, B.C., of course, means before Christ. Just about all the new textbooks have changed it. They're calling it B.C.E. Yes, sir? In a homeschool book your wife uses? Second grade book. Second grade book, B.C.E., which means before the common era. They're working really hard to make sure Christ is gone from the schools. One guy said, why didn't God stop the shooting at Columbine High School? I said, well, duh. God's not allowed in school anymore. <laughs> Don't blame him. You threw him out and then blame him for the shooting? Well, you know, think about it, okay? Just think about it. The Schofield Reference Bible here, of course, uses the date 4004 B.C., but they themselves don't believe it. And then he says there's a gap in there, the gap theory. Okay? But anybody that just simply studies the Bible, adds up the dates, is going to come you know, right around this time, about 4000 B.C., plus or minus maybe a few hundred. There are a few places that are kind of tough to get past. Okay? And the Bible tells, tells us to beware, you know, to, not be, to be careful about endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. You know? So I would be cautious about getting into the endless genealogies, but boy, he, he does a very thorough job of tr tracing through some of the uh, very difficult genealogies to go through, if you read through all that. Anyway, here's the conflict. <clears throat> the textbook says pretty clearly the earth is billions of years old. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. So we have a real clear conflict, conflict here. Somebody's wrong. Was Jesus lying? That's one option. Did he not understand science, or was he right? I can't think of any other options, okay? Either Jesus was right or he was wrong. If you think of another one, you know, please explain it to me. I'd like to hear that. If he's right, then the earth is about 6,000 years old. If he's wrong, well, then forget everything else he says. If he doesn't know that, it doesn't, doesn't matter what else he says, okay? Some people say, well, I believe Jesus was a good man. But he wasn't God. I said, well, you're crazy. He claimed he was God. So you can't say he's a good man because he's lying. He's a bad man. I like uh, Josh McDowell. We've got a couple of books by him in the library there. Fabulous, logical thinker, you know. He says, Jesus was the Lord, or he's a liar, or he's a lunatic. There are no other options. You cannot say he's a good man. Either he is what he said he was, or he's a liar, or he's a lunatic. Crazy. Okay? Anyway. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Thou, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. In our seminar notebook, we go through probably 40 references to where it says, the beginning. Now, some of them don't necessarily, I found the ones that deal with the beginning of the earth. Let me get um, Bible, God's word for windows here. And just type in, uh, in the, well, let's see, we'll just try, type the beginning. 91 references to the beginning. If you filter through, some of them talk about the beginning of somebody's kingdom, you know, and it's obviously not something talking about the beginning of the creation of the world. But here the, uh, the Bible many times gives us clues, you know, when was the beginning? For instance, the Bible says, uh, talking about Satan, says he was a liar from the beginning. He was a murderer from the beginning. Oh, uh, Abel uh, was murdered by his brother Cain, you know. Just, to say, just like Cain murdered Abel, Satan was a murderer from the beginning. Well, that tells us when the beginning was, okay? The, the beginning. Here we have, Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth. So, when was the beginning? 
how old is the earth? I've got some Christians uh, around the country that absolutely get angry at me and, and you know, discourage people from listening to my videotapes because I am dogmatic about the age of the earth. It is not billions of years old. And Hugh Ross, for instance, I debated Hugh Ross for three hours on the John Anchor. He won't debate me again. I wish he would. He's a nice guy. You know, I, I, I would try to be nice to him. But um, he says, well, it's not an issue that we should be arguing about. Okay, well, then agree with me, and there won't be any argument. <laughs> it's real simple. He keeps saying it's a non-issue, but he's the one that keeps talking about it, saying the earth has to be billions of years old, 17.46 billion years old, was <laughs> something like that, you know. Could this possibly be correct? I mean, is that, does, could this 6,000 year age for the earth, you know, it's been 2,000 since Christ and 4,000 before, could that be correct? How do you explain carbon dating, light from the stars, all the different people we have, all the different races? How do you explain the fossils in the ground, the coal, the oil, the, you know, natural gas? And there are people who think Christians are absolutely nuts for believing the earth is only 6,000 years old. I say, fellas, now think about it. First of all, I would not say only 6,000 years old. 6,000 is a long time. It's hard to remember, you know, six months ago, six years ago, 60 years ago. I wasn't even here, okay? 600 years ago. Columbus hadn't even come over here yet, you know? It's just hard to comprehend 600 years ago. The bigger the numbers get, the more the human brain kind of just fades out. You know, they just won't fit in the human brain. Congress knows that and takes advantage of it all the time, you know. <laughs> oh, we're only going to spend nine billion. Oh, okay. What's a billion? You know? <laughs> a billion's a lot, okay? A lot, a lot, a lot. But uh, the 4004 BC, and I, again, I don't put the exact date 4004, but I, do, I see no reason to reject it. But I always say in my seminar, about, you know, 6,000 years ago, God created the heaven and the earth. And some people, when they looked at the creation dates, you know, said, well, maybe the Lord's coming in the year 2000, because that'll be 6,000 years, and that'll fit perfect, you know. Six days of work, a day of rest. 6,000 years of work, a thousand years of rest. The millennial reign of Christ. Wow, the Lord's coming in the year 2000. Let's go sell everything and stand on a mountain. Don't do that, okay? I have no idea when the Lord's coming, okay? The one guy wrote the book, 88 Reasons Why the Lord Will Come in 88. <laughs> I've got it in the library there. Don't write a book like that, okay? Of course, then the next year he wrote another one, 89 Reasons Why the Lord Will Come in 89. Not many people bought that one, I don't think. And he gave up writing on that. There were the Millerites in, uh, here in America in 1841. They had set the date, 1841, the Lord is coming back. There's a huge following of the Millerites. Ah, you missed it, guys, okay? I wouldn't put a date on when the Lord's coming. I have no clue. My job is to be faithful to the end. Just serve the Lord. You know, so don't charge up your credit cards and then say, okay, now, Lord, come, you know, now, please. <laughs> don't do that, right? But I do many debates at universities, and atheists often ask me the question, you know, who did Adam's sons marry? And if you're a Christian, you're going to get this question inevitably. If, somebody, if you're a Christian trying to witness for your faith, somebody will ask this question, who did Adam's sons marry? And it's a really, honestly, a fair question, right? The Bible says, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. By the way, we have no idea where Eden was. There's a river in Eden called Euphrates. You mentioned in Genesis chapter 3 or 2. 2 or 3. Two or three. I don't remember. Anyway. And that's, there's a river today in the Gons Ransu Baghdad called Euphrates. So what? It doesn't mean it's the same river. There's a city in England called York and there's one over here called New York. Okay? 36 of the states in America have a city named Greenville. What does that mean? Well, it's a nice sounding name. You live in a village that is surrounded by green. Oh, people like that, you know, a Greenville. You know? <laughs> That's all it means. So I, there's no way to tell where the Garden of Eden was, okay? I think it's probably under 500 feet of mud right here in Pensacola, Florida. <clears throat> yes, sir? If there, if there really was a worldwide flood, wouldn't it be impossible for the river Euphrates that currently runs today to be the one? Yeah, the flood would make it, you're right, it'd be impossible for the same river to be the, the river Euphrates to be the same one. Because the whole topography is totally rearranged. There's no way to tell. See, people say, well, Noah's Ark landed near Mount Ararat, and that's not far from there. Well, duh, the Bible doesn't say Noah built the Ark anywhere near the Garden of Eden. I mean, that's 1,600 years later, okay? 
how far could civilization have traveled? And even then, if he gets in the boat and floats around for a year and finally lands, how, how far could you float in a year, you know? We don't know he was anywhere near the Garden of Eden when he built it, nor anywhere near the Garden of Eden when he landed. <laughs> There's just no possible way to know such a thing, I don't think, all right? Anyway, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and he built a city, blah, blah, blah. Well, who's his wife? Well, it clearly does not say he found her there, okay? He didn't go to Nod and find a wife. It does not say that. He went to Nod and with his wife produced children. That's what it says. So, who did, Adam mar who did Seth marry? Uh, of course, you know, we don't care about Enoch much because he wasn't part of the, uh, I mean, part Cain much. He wasn't part of the genealogy. It's also interesting to note, as you read through the Bible, the only people that it gives their ages when their son was born are the ones in a direct line to Jesus. It tells us who Cain's son was and who his grandson was. It gives the names, but no ages are given. When you read through about, in the book of Genesis about the Dukes of Edom, you know, you wonder, why does this book end? Why is this in Genesis? What's this, who cares about the Dukes of Edom, you know, and ha Hazard and all that stuff? Well, it doesn't give the ages for them. They're not in the genealogy. And for Cain, it doesn't give the ages of his either. But who's his wife? And who did Seth marry? Now, in the case of Seth, of course, it gives the age. He was 105 when his son was born. Well, who's his wife? Well, the evolutionists are the guys who have the very serious problem with this. And I always try to... T t t take a look at what I call the big picture. You know, step back and let's look at the big picture, okay? Is this really important we should be fighting about? You know, husbands and wives, you squeeze the toothpaste from the wrong end, okay? Step back and look at the big picture. Be thankful she brushes her teeth, okay? I can show you some that don't, <laughs> all right? <laughs> Go buy her own toothpaste for her and you, do, you squeeze yours the way you want and let her squeeze hers the way she wants. It's not worth arguing about, okay? We fight over the dumbest things. I remember I was at a chiropractor one time, and my kids were like, I don't know, 10, 11, 12, probably, you know. And uh, the chiropractor had these two electro four electrodes on my back, you know, stimulating the muscles, and he laid this bag of rocks on there to help hold them in place and kind of give them a massage mm -hmm. effect. Well, there's this extra bag of rocks, just a, like a, a bag, you know, full of little rocks, pea gravel. And so my two, two of my kids started fighting over who gets to play with the bag of rocks. <laughs> Many times as they were growing up, I would say, man, we're going to have a competition. Who can argue over the dumbest thing, you know? <laughs> this has got to be close to the limit. Arguing over who gets to play with a bag of rocks. And if any of you have brothers or sisters, you know what I'm talking about, okay? They will argue over <laughs> absolutely stupid things, you know? <laughs> who is going to care, you know? Eric, I'll tell you the story about the time I stopped and bought him a Coke, you know, and they're in the back seat right behind me arguing over who's my turn to get a drink, you know, my turn, oh my, you've had enough, my turn. So I just calmly reached back, grabbed it, <laughs> threw it out the window, kept on driving. <laughs> He's got this big, <laughs> whoa, whoa, what was that? <laughs> Nobody gets the Coke. Shut up, sit down, we're driving, okay? But when you compare the question of who did Cain and Seth and these guys marry, okay, which is a fair question, when you compare that to the problem the evolutionists have, it really looks insignificant. And that's what I like to look at the big picture, okay? They believe 18 or 20 billion years ago, there was a big bang where nothing exploded. We covered that weeks ago. All the matter in the universe, you know, squeezed into a dot smaller than a period on a page. And then 4.6 billion years ago, the earth formed. It began as a hot ball of rock. This is what the textbooks teach. Now, the evolutionists get mad at me and say, well, that's not part of evolution. I say, well, then get it out of the textbook. If that's really not part of evolution theory, and it's really obviously not provable scientifically, then let's, why don't you help me remove it? This is part of the evolution theory. Then the book says, 3.9 billion years ago, Earth cooled down enough for it to begin to rain. And it rained and rained and rained and rained and rained and filled the oceans with water. And in the oceans, the first <laughs> living organisms appeared. This guy says, millions of years of torrential rains created great oceans. And swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Sure is. It don't even happen. That's how slow it is. Here's an article just a few weeks ago in the University of Bath. It says, scientists crack the 40-year-old DNA puzzle and point to hot soup at the origin of life. New theory that explains why the language of our genes is more complex than it needs to be. 
also suggests that the primordial soup where life began on earth was hot, not cold, as many scientists believe. Yep, the first living organ, the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. So according to the Big Bang Theory, 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down, rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive, three billion years ago. And that first life form found somebody to marry. <coughs> There's a good trick, you know and something to eat, of course, and slowly evolved into everything we see today. So your great, 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 grandpa was soup. That's the Big Bang Theory in a nutshell. Anyway, uh, so they, they teach we all came from a rock, which I think has got to be, I, I've said it a hundred times, thousands of times. That's got to be the dumbest idea in the history of humanity. <laughs> Just so dumb. And you stop and think about it, you know. You'd have to be blinded. Uh, the Bible says they did not want to retain God in their knowledge, so God will send them strong delusion. God himself would be required to make somebody deluded enough to believe their grandfather was a rock. I just, uh, think about it, you know. Anyway, who did Adam's sons marry? Compared to the evolutionist problem, our problem is very minor. Because they believe, you know, the first human couple have ancestors which was a rock you know talk about a genetic bottleneck what is the gene code <laughs> of a rock you know? who's the guy is it uh, one of the guys called into the program uh, he said it was rocks plural Jared, Jared yeah it wasn't a rock it was rocks oh okay a pink one and a blue one yeah right okay <laughs> two rocks is the ancestor well who did Adam's sons marry well it's real simple Adam, the days of Adam, after he begotten Seth, were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. I've often said, how many kids could you have in 800 years? Several, right? Jim Bob Duger in uh, Arkansas, a friend of mine, he's an Arkansas representative for a while, he's got 15 kids in 15 years. He may have more now, I don't know, I haven't talked to him in a couple years, probably has 17, you know. We met a family from Minnesota one time with 20 kids, all of them under 20. Hey, it's cold in Minnesota. But uh, 15 kids in 15 years. Well, man, in 800 years, you could have a huge family. Now, the Jewish tradition, and it's purely Jewish tradition, says Adam and Eve had 56 children. Now, think about it. There is no reason to not have a large family. You have the whole world, I mean, absolutely rent-free no utility payments, okay, infinite food supply. <laughs> Just go ahead and have a whole bunch of kids, you know. It is so neat raising kids. I really enjoyed raising my three and thousands of times wished we had more. Thousands of times. And now with the four grandkids, it's, I can't wait to get more. It's like, man, come on, where's some more grandkids, guys? Let's go. Uh, well, there's a guy who came to visit here. He has 91 grandkids. He only brought 12 of them to Nice Adventureland. Uh, I met a family in, was in North Carolina. The grandpa had 16 kids, and his kids averaged six apiece. He has 96 grandkids. Talk about a family reunion. Anyway, who did Adam's sons marry? Well, duh, they had to marry sisters. People say, you can't marry sisters. Well, I know you can't today. At least you shouldn't, okay, <laughs> for some real obvious genetic reasons, unless you're a redneck, you know. But uh, you marry, they had to marry sisters. Number one, there's no other choice. And no one would have thought it was wrong. Number two, who would you report them to? <laughs> you say, you're going to marry your sister. I'm going to tell. Oh, who are you going to tell? My brother that married his sister? Hmm? <laughs> Just exactly who are you going to tattle to, tattletale to, you know? Uh, thirdly, there were no laws against it until 2,500 years later. Somebody got your Bible, read Leviticus 18, 6. Leviticus 18, start with verse 6. Whoever's got that one first. All right, read that real loud so they can hear it on the camera there. None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. At this point, here we have 2,500 years later, God is revealing the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. And he says, from now on, guys, you can't marry close kin. But see, in almost all cultures of the world at this time, and even after this time, people were marrying very close kin. It was very common for the pharaohs to marry sisters. Very common. 
Uh, Charles Darwin, just 170 years ago, deliberately married his first cousin because he thought it would give him, you know, uh, improved children. He said, I'm smart. You know, she comes from a smart line, so this, the kids will be smart. Well, it didn't work. Okay, they had 10 children. Most of them died of horrible diseases when they were young. Some were severely retarded. Well, it's called inbreeding, okay? Jeff Foxworthy, you might be a redneck if, you know, you go to a family reunion to pick up women. Yeah, you might be a redneck. Uh, so 2,500 years after the creation, God finally says, okay, guys, that's it. No more. You can't marry close kin. Plus, people say, what about genetic similarity, marrying sisters? Well, duh. Adam married his rib. How much more genetically similar can you get? Okay. People say, how do we get the four blood types from only one couple, from one person? Oh, there's an interesting article about that on AnswersInGenesis.org. If you want to read the whole article about how do you get four blood types, you know, A, B, A, B, and O. Type O is by far the most common. I've got type O positive, which is the most common blood there is. A negative is the rarest blood. But how do you get four blood types from one person? Actually, just one person, Adam, really. Oh, it's not a problem. They cover all that in that article there. But So marrying sisters is not a big deal compared to the, especially when you compare it to the evolution problem, okay? And you don't notice this reading your Bible, but the, the graph we have in our seminar notebook, which is in the bookstore, or we have them laminated if you want them for placemats when your skeptic friends come for lunch. You can, you can really stir up a conversation with one of these things. But I think every Sunday school class ought to have one of these charts you know, nailed up there. Adam lived long enough to know his great-great-great-great-great-great-grandson. Noah's daddy could have known Adam for 56 years. People say, the Bible was handed down generation after generation. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Adam lived long enough to know Lamech. Of course, he obviously would have known Methuselah and all these other guys. Methuselah lived long enough to know Noah and Shem, his son, all three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem lived long enough to know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, the Bible wasn't handed down generation after generation. But... Uh, um, Shem lived after the flood long enough to know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, there is some controversy. Notice on my chart, I have Terah, Abraham's father, at 70 when Abraham is born. There are some who argue, no, he was 130 when Abraham was born. There is, uh, there is really quite a controversy. Abraham, uh, Terah had uh, several other children besides uh, Abraham, and there's some argument that says, well, he was 70 when he begat his first child, but it wasn't Abraham. I've read all the controversy as carefully as I know how to read anything, and I put this in here with a footnote that, look, there is some controversy. I don't know for sure that this is correct. I believe that it is, and I give all the reasons why. Go to my website, drdino.com, and there's a long article about how old was Terah when Abram was born. If he was 70 then Shem could have known Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If we add another 60 years in there, then he could have only known Abraham and Isaac. He could not have known Jacob. Not a big deal, okay? Nothing to get upset about and split the church over, okay? But there, just so you're aware, there is a conflict, and you may want to study it for yourself and see if my logic is correct. I put 70. I'm willing to be convinced. Otherwise, you know, I may not be right. It may be 130. There are some other creation ministries. Oh, it's 130. Okay, well... And they go through all their logic. Why I read all that stuff about, you know, how old was Terah when they left? He was 205, and Abraham left, and, you know, you can't, don't have enough time in there for him to be 100 and get Isaac and all that stuff. You can read it for yourself and try to decipher it if you'd like, okay? I still remain fairly convinced that my chart is correct. But I'm very willing to listen to reason and logic if you, if you have some on that. Anyway, Jacob is the guy that had... Uh, four wives, you know, uh, and got, he got tricked. Jacob, his name means trickster or something similar to that. And he was always tricking his brother. And finally, when it comes time for him to get married, you know, what you sow, that shall you also reap. He gets tricked by his own father-in-law, ends up marrying the wrong girl. Okay, <laughs> you can read the story. So anyway, he ends up with four wives and, uh, and has 13 kids, 12 boys, one girl. Anybody know the girl's name? Dinah, Dinah right. One of these boys, dad likes him the best, and so he makes him a coat of many colors, Joseph. The brothers get jealous, beat him up, throw him down in the well, you know, and end up down in Egypt, and he becomes the vice pharaoh, or whatever you call him. And so while he's in Egypt as the vice pharaoh, he invites the brothers to come down and live with him. And it's, you know, a really amazing story. But finally, Jacob is introducing, or Joseph's introducing his dad, Jacob, to Pharaoh. 
And Pharaoh said to Jacob, How old are you? And Jacob said, I'm a hundred and thirty. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been. Well, duh, Jacob, you tricked everybody else all your life. Of course you're going to have a bad life that way, you know. Uh, but anyway, that's another story. He says, and they have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers. I read that 30-some years ago as a brand-new Christian and thought, what is this? Jacob says, I'm 130, but this is really nothing compared to my ancestors. Well, yes, that is correct. When you consider Jacob could have known Shem, Arphaxad, Selah, and Eber. Well, if you're 130, but you know a 600-year-old guy down the street, you just don't feel so old anymore, okay? Anyway, here, let's go back to the age here. The textbook says the earth is billions of years old. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. So was he lying, was he stupid, or was he right? I don't know of any other choices. If you think of one, let me know. I'll add it to my PowerPoint. But that's the only ones I can figure out. He was right or he was wrong. And if he's wrong, then he's stupid or he's deliberately lying. Textbook says billions of years. Millions of years ago. Billions of years ago. This is in books all over the country. And even many Christians are teaching this. Hugh Ross, Reasons to Believe, has a large ministry teaching the earth is billions of years old, writing all kinds of books about it. He says, God needed billions of years to get it just right. I said, Hugh, you have a different God than I do. Don Stoner, I had lunch with Don Stoner, Gerald Schroeder, nice guys. They believe the earth is billions of years old. The Navigator's Bible Study Group, they publish all of Hugh Ross's books. It's called Nav Press. They've got a castle in Colorado. I ended up, I got saved because of the Navigators Bible Study Group. I love the Navigators. They led my brother to the Lord. And because of that, I ended up getting saved. And they, they, brought, they bought a castle in Europe, took it apart, and brought it over and rebuilt it in Colorado Springs. Whole castle. It's, anybody been there to the Nav, Navigator Castle? It's incredible. This monster castle. I went and spent three or four days there. Those guys were awesome. They would get up at five in the morning, go off by themselves and memorize. They memorize, memorize, memorize. Here they read the Bible like crazy and still don't get the importance of this age of the earth issue. They teach the earth is billions of years old. James Dobson had Hugh Ross on his program as a guest and he got more hate mail, James Dobson did, from that program than anything else he's ever done, is what he said in the news. People got all upset with James Dobson because James Dobson said, I believe the earth is billions of years old. The Dakes Study Bible. Now, Francis Dakes, if I, if, I have, if I have the story straight, and I believe I do, was not a scholar of anything, okay? He could barely read, and this was what I've heard. And Francis Dakes did his study Bible based on uh, uh, what the Spirit revealed to him. He just got visions. Oh, wow, and most of his footnotes. I wouldn't trust the Dakes Bible for any further than I could throw a bus, okay? So don't go by his notes at the bottom of the page. Oh, wow, well, Dakes said it, so it must be true. Schofield study Bible. Okay, anyway, the Schofield Study Bible is the one that I got as a brand new Christian. I mean, I got saved out of the Methodist church, started going to a little Baptist church, carrying my Revised Standard Version with me. And my preacher says, you need to get a Bible. I said, I got a Bible. He said, no, you need to get a real Bible. I said, I got a real Bible. <laughs> I was offended. What? You know? He said, he got, talked me into getting an old Schofield Bible, you know, the old time one that has the proper names index, the really old one, you know. And so I've still got it. It's in there. It's pretty worn out. You pick it up and it falls apart. But... And then I wore that one out and got another one, you know, and, got, and I ended up wearing out three or four Schofield Bibles. Uh, good study notes in many cases, but he believes the earth is billions of years old, and he's wrong. Pat Robertson, John Ankerberg, I couldn't believe it. John Ankerberg from uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, had me on as a guest on, on talking about the age of the earth. And we did a couple of programs, and they aired them. And I, I showed how the earth cannot be billions of years old. And then he had me come on with Hugh Ross and had a debate, and John has slowly, over the last five years, become an old earth creationist. He has followed Hugh Ross. Yes, sir? He had Hugh Ross on his show the other night. This is August or yeah, October 2005. Um, now, he's a nice guy in many ways. I've preached many times on the same platform with John Ankerberg at, at uh, Stealing the Mind conferences. Nice guy, smart guy, very smart guy but he's wrong about that one, okay? Dead wrong. Benny Hinn, of course, Benny Hinn's wrong about all kinds of things, you know, but <laughs> he teaches. John Hagee, big name TV preacher, you know, has this beautiful charts he preaches in front of, you know, the big posters. He, he says the earth is billions of years old. Uh, Lee Strobel, 
He wrote the book, The Case for the Creator, The Case for Christ. What other ones did he write, Jonathan? Uh, case for Easter, Case for Faith. Uh, and he advertises on my, on my radio program, you know. But he, he believes the earth is billions of years old. Hank Hanegraaff. I got a call, was it yesterday? The guy said, hey, Hank Hanegraaff's blasting you on his radio program again. I said, well, he's done that about 10 times. Why didn't he have me on, you know? <laughs> okay. He says the earth is billions of years old. There's a long story of how he took over that program, you know, and a, a, a lawsuit from the owner's daughter. You know, he kind of just muscled his way in and took it over. But Chuck Colson has the prison ministry. We're doing a great work for God, but teaches the earth is billions of years old. Norm Geisler, Billy Graham. One lady from North Carolina called me oh, a year ago now. She said, Brother Hovind, Billy Graham's older brother. I said, wait, stop right there. He has an older brother? He said, oh, yeah. Billy Graham's older brother is in our Sunday school class here in North Carolina. And he watched your videotapes, and he loves them. And he's trying to get Billy to watch him to get him straightened about, out about the age of the earth. <laughs> Yay. Go. Now, Billy Graham has done much good for the Lord. There's no question. There's going to be thousands, if not millions, in heaven because of Billy Graham. But just because, that doesn't mean they're right on everything. He is wrong about this age of the earth issue, okay? You say, why does it matter? Well, duh. It puts death before sin. Now, we have the Rechmanites here in Pensacola who believe there's a gap between verse 1 and 2, but do not believe there's any death before sin. They think the earth is 13,000 years old, or I think 13,000 is the number they use, and, you know, the Genesis 1, 1, and then there's a 6,000-year gap, and then Genesis 1, 2. Well, what happened in the gap? I've never gotten them to tell me, you know, what happened in this gap? Why do you need this gap? And, uh, they, you know, I don't know, I think they're just trying to defend a theory that was been taught by, you know, grandfather and papa, and they, gotta, they say, you got to believe it. No, forget what grandpa says, forget what papa says. What does the book say, okay? <laughs> so, there are those who do teach there was a gap, but not, not death. But most people who believe the earth is billions of years old inevitably have to have death before sin. Ask them, what happened in the gap? They say, oh, there was a pre-Adamic race, and they were killed when Satan fell from heaven, and God had to re-fix the earth. Wait, stop right there. You already got a heresy. You got death before sin. That's heresy, okay? The Bible says death reigned from Adam to Moses. When did death start in the world? Adam. By man came death, in Adam all die. Well, who cares about the age of the earth? Well, for one thing, the credibility of Genesis is clearly at stake. Because I guarantee nobody reading the Bible without any outside influence nobody would come up with anything other than about 6,000 years. You find 5,000 people that have never heard of this controversy at all, hand them the Bible and say, I want you to read this through about five times, and then tell me what you come up with. They'll all come back and say, you know, this book teaches God made the world in six days about 6,000 years ago. That's what you're going to get. So the credibility of Genesis is at stake. I, I think the question is so simple. Can the average person read the book and understand it or do you have to have some guru tell us what it means? If you, I get real, and I've been in these churches most of my life, you know, where the preacher gets up in the pulpit and says, well, this verse would be better translated, blah, 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 you know, or it says in the original, blah, 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 oh, man, red flags ought to go up right there. Wait, wait, wait. Are you trying to set yourself up as a cult leader where I have to have you to understand this book? You mean I can't read it by myself and understand it? I think you just ought to get little red flags there. Now, maybe he's not a cult leader, okay, but that's, that's sure a cult tendency to say, you need me to lead you. No, I think the Holy Spirit and God's Word can do fine on their own. I'm glad for your expertise. I'm glad to listen to your preaching. I love what I'm hearing. But no, I don't, don't give me this I need you to lead me stuff, okay? God does call pastors and deacons and elders. I understand, okay? And you should have leaders. But uh, th that's a dangerous situation when they start correcting, you know, God's Word. They'll say, well, it says in the original. Right, let me see this original you're getting this from, okay? Nobody's seen that in 800 years. You know, where is this original? Secondly, the credibility of Jesus is clearly at stake. He quoted Genesis 25 times. If you get Henry Morris's uh, Defender's Bible, anybody have one of those with you? Okay. In the Defender's Bible, go to page uh, 1556, the Defender's Study Bible, okay? Henry Morris, whom I love in the Lord and uh, is a good personal friend of mine, and his son John Morris, he's now the president of Institute for Creation Research, ICR. Henry Morris is an unbelievable Bible scholar, okay? 
Uh, he did this. It's a King James Bible with all of Henry Morris's footnotes at the bottom. And they are awesome. I mean, you can see some amazing things in his footnotes. At the end, now, I disagree with him on something. Very seriously disagree. He says there's errors in the King James Bible, and he says there's copyist errors. So when we sell the Bible, we have a disclaimer that goes with it. We love Brother Morris. This is the best version, best Bible we know of with the footnotes, but we think he's wrong and we, and we point out why. Okay, we'll do that later in part seven. And before I did that, I, I believe, you know, you ought to talk to people face to face. I wrote Henry a letter and then called him on the phone. I said, Brother Morris, I love your Bible. I'm going to sell it. However, I'm going to put a disclaimer with it. Here is the disclaimer. Would you read this over? Let me know what you think. Just a little one-page disclaimer. When we talked, he said, well, I wish you didn't have to do that. I said, I do too. I wish you'd fix it, you know, <laughs> and I won't have to do it, okay? Your footnotes are wrong in a couple places. Anyway, in spite of all that, he has an awesome appendix at the end on page 1556 talking about the uh, 25 times that Jesus quoted Genesis. He lists all the verses, okay? All the verses that the beginning is mentioned. I mean, he's got some amazing notes at the end of this, at the Defender's Bible, if you want to go through some of this. Uh, this is, how much is a hardback in the bookstore? 25, 30 bucks? And then the softback is leather is a little more, you know, 35 or 40. But anyway, you can see that appendix and find all the verses where Jesus himself quoted Genesis. So, we got a problem here. If Genesis is not accurate, Jesus is either lying or he, is, he has been deceived because he's passing on false information. Just about every other book in the Bible refers to Genesis. There are 200 references in the New Testament to Genesis. And again, they're listed in the end of the book here, uh, if you want to look through that. So this is a very important topic. The evolutionists really care about this topic of the age of the earth. Jesus said, had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. He wrote of me. See, this is an important theory to evolutionists. The age of the earth is an important topic to evolutionists because if you take away the billions of years, their theory looks real stupid. See, there's something about a fairy tale. You know, they start off long ago and far away, and the brain fades off into the clouds. Oh, wow, maybe it could have happened, you know? <laughs> Look, adding more time doesn't solve the problem. Doesn't solve it. If you say, well, the man zoomed through the air, you say, well, that's obviously, you know, Hollywood special effects or some fairy tale. What if the man walked through the air slowly? It's still a fairy tale, okay? People don't walk through the air, okay? <laughs> so the adding billions of years doesn't help. There are all kinds of scientific ways to prove the earth is not billions of years old, but I want to establish in this class, and we'll be done here, the Bible clearly teaches approximately 6,000 years, plus or minus a few hundred. You want to argue about some genealogies? Okay, we can do that, but... You're not going to get billions of years. Now, Hugh Ross points out there are three names missing. Yeah. He says, see, the genealogy could be covering billions of years. Three names does not equal billions of years, okay? And there's a reason those three names are missing. And we'll get into that in about 12 years in this class. Okay. So we're going to take up next time talking about some scientific ways to show the Earth simply cannot be billions of years old. They might need billions of years for their theory. Well, that's, sorry, that's tough. They should pick a new theory. It is not billions of years old. The Bible clearly teaches 6,000. I think we'll see next week. Science also clearly shows us it's not billions of years. They might need it. Well, that's, like I said, too bad. It's not available. We'll take that up next.